I worked 20 years ago that any meeting after 5 o'clock had to include gin or bourbon or scotch. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to delay that just a little bit. My uh, great, great thanks uh, to Victor and Brian and my friend Joshua, who always chooses to be out of town when I'm in college. <laughs> uh, this is such, uh, such a great day, and I, I told the panelists we're going to dispense with any uh, intros and just do a 30 second uh, of who we are. Uh, 30 years ago, I wrote a dissertation on the early Requiem in the Office for the Dead in Spain and uh, Colonial New Spain. Uh, and I tried to do a number of things with it in terms of cultural history, which I'm going to try to get into today. And I've gone on to do publications on uh, Morales and uh, uh, manuscripts in Mexico City and Puebla and Salve, Regina, traditions, and those sort of thing. I've taken a left turn recently into Villa Lobos, which is my new fascination in the world. Um, uh, Victor, uh, who sent me uh, last Thursday, a very intense message about what we had to do at the round table. <laughs> uh, had, had all of these wonderful goals, which uh, uh, we are all struggling to, to find exactly the right thing to say. Uh, I draw attention to this amazing uh, 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 proposal for the conference and the ideas that are stated about global musicology. Uh, new world topics entailing issues of colonialism, subalternity, slavery, African diaspora, neglected lives of these various people, and the dialogue between musicology and ethnomusicology, which was a really fascinating part of my graduate school days. Uh, many people know that my mentor, Robert Snow, was this incredible expert on Spanish and colonial traditions uh, and an extraordinary, brilliant, positive positivistic, old-fashioned, cranky guy who could just tell you uh, the complete Roman liturgy if you had time to sit there and listen, and how pre-Tridentine Spanish liturgy uh, affects uh, composition and then the transition to the Tridentine liturgy, and all of these extraordinary issues of manuscripts and the whole Morales Guevara Victoria tradition. Uh, not many people know that when I was uh, in graduate school, I was also really, really influenced by Gerard Behat, who was doing some of his really uh, fundamental thinking in the 80s and 90s uh, about performance as text. And I was going back to some of Gerard's uh, uh, articles, and I ran across this one on um, Afro-Brazilian religious music. And he goes on in the intro of this article, about what music as a reflection of cultural value says about world view and the fundamental nature of music and religion. Now, one of the things that I tried to do in my dissertation that the world wasn't quite ready for then <laughs> was to say that the early requiem in the Escobar and Morales period is just as important for the why of the requiem as it is for the what. Of, of these pieces and the manuscripts and all of those things. And that to me was the bringing together of ethnomusicology and musicology. And it's still such a fundamental aspect of what we talk about or need to talk about in the colonial context, the why of certain traditions being so fundamentally important, not just the what of this choir book and this liturgical service and this composer but how these things up add up to the why of the Salve Regina in 1620 in Puebla in that amazingly complicated multi-ethnic society that Edir was telling us about this morning with these Villancicos and how amazing to think of someone singing in that choir singing Franco's music or Bermuda's music and you have African descended musicians, native peoples, in that choir of the Spanish. So, um, where I've come from in my life. Uh, 30 years ago, uh, I proposed a lot of things, and I hope the world is ready for them now, <laughs> that, that, that Escobar and Morales and other people were writing in part to suppress the importance <coughs> of Arab and Jewish traditions, which I still believe, and to suppress the prominence of women's in Funeral cer women in funeral ceremonies, which I still believe. And they were also writing in a kind of pedagogical way to say this is the good death. 
this is the death of the king, the bishop, the noble person that you are to aspire to and to get the official liturgy and the music of the church, which in colonial New Spain would become, this is the good European death, which I think that is very important still in understanding late 16th, 17th century <coughs> music. So an example of this from my own work that I'm gonna just refer to very quickly is my fascination, uh, once again, with the Salve Regina in Puebla and Mexico City, but specifically with Puebla today, so that after 1600, you have these Spanish clerics in Puebla who are maintaining an archaic, illegal religious ceremony. The Salve, the independent Salve service, performing it year round, not just in the quarter of the church year that you were supposed to do it. That is both a canonic law problem and a vice regal legal issue that they are not following the Tridentine liturgy of the church and that they are spending a great deal of money to copy manuscripts that show that. So to me, the why of the Salve Regina becomes really very, very complicated and interesting. And then when you have this man, Juan Palafox y Mendoza, going to such great lengths. So when the people nearby Puebla in the little city of Cholula, which is in the 16th century a much more important religious center in some ways than is Puebla, when these people in Cholula are celebrating their icon, the Lady of Remedios, Palafox launches this campaign. And Palafox, hoping to deprive the secular clergy of the aesthetic base of the Indian church, this is J.I. Israel writing about this event, they moved all the Indian virgins and the images of Jesus and the saints and holy ornaments into their own chapel. In one of the notable events, a dozen Franciscans wielding knives and sticks and breaking doors and windows as they went, broke into a parochial chapel in Cholula where they seized a famous virgin much venerated by the Chichultas, complete with her silver tiara. I love this, you know, the Franciscans grabbing both the Indian icon and her silver tiara and cutting the belfry ropes as they left to prevent the alarm. Now this is a very Meyer beer opera-esque <laughs> incident of these swashbuckling, swashbuckling Franciscans. And to have Palafox, one of the most fascinating people in colonial and Mexican history, in charge of this campaign to define which Marian icon will be venerated. Then in charge of creating these glorious choir books with the music of Franco and Bermudez and Morales and a suspicious piece attributed to Victoria that Javier and I have both talked about in articles. So for Palafox to be that engaged in a war of imagery and music and rituals, that to me is a great example of why these choir books and the why of the music and the why of the ceremony. With that, I'm going to shut up, and Rachel will take up. Hello, my name is Rachel Carpentier. I'm a graduate student here at Boston University, and I work a lot on um, 15th or late 15th and through the 16th century uh, sources of sacred global polygamy. Um, my dissertation in progress um, has to do specifically with Luther Rochier, who's the rogue court composer in the last quarter of the 16th century in Madrid, as you all know. Um, and he is sort of is an interesting intersection with this conversation today because his works are remarkably well represented in the Pueblo Cathedral and not in other important musical centers by any stretch of the imagination to the extent that we see them there. So um, there's an, an, an interesting intersection with them there. Um, I only have one slide, so I'm gonna queue it up right now um, so that it's just ready to go.
By the way, it looks like they're setting up the booze outside, <laughs> so, you know, uh, as Grayson said, you know, I, I mean, I'm not in charge, but... You only have to last 45 more minutes. Okay. It was hoped that this... Oh, yeah, there you go. We're not going to get to that in a minute, but it's, you can start trying to clear your way through the bad quality of the film right now, so... It was hoped that this roundtable on polyphonic sources would highlight the conference theme of material culture and the transmission of manuscripts, prints, instruments, and other musical objects and commodities, all while approaching the idea of a global musicology. What does it mean to study colonial repertories, especially polyphonic music, uh, globally? And what other method methodology is it replacing if we start to do that? To start, maybe it has something to do with the terms we use to describe these repertories. Grayson has just highlighted some of the ways that colonial New Spanish um, music defies European-based methods of description for style and technique. Terms like, terms like stile antico or polychoral abound as descriptors of colonial repertories, and with them come associations about style, genre, form, source format, nationality, and many other things. These are, of course, very useful terms that we would be remiss to discard, but perhaps they need to be slightly revised in order to better fit the repertories at hand. Successful examples of this already exist in the scholarship. In the introduction to his catalog on Mexico City, uh, the polyphonic books Javier Marin has offered a new working definition of stile antico for the repertories in his study, and the recent polychoralities edited volume and the work of Noel Regan in particular is very <coughs> careful to distinguish terms for Roman and Iberian polychoral music from the more standard ones used for the Venetian school. But perhaps it is worth, worth, ask, worth asking ourselves and discussing today, later, uh, what other familiar and useful terms might benefit from a slight redefinition to better describe these or your repertories. These limits in our stylistic terminology may extend to periodization as well. The very concept of periodization is still largely teleological, and with that comes an inherent sense of improvement over time. The result can be the mistaken notion that the continued performance of older repertoire or the conscious choice of a composer to write in an old style, both of which occur, as we all know, in abundance in Puebla and Mexico and across New Spain, are sometimes still referred to as old-fashioned at best and as regressive at worst. This invites the consideration of historiographic issues central to this conference, including the enduring presence of the so-called black legend. By way of example, we can tie into something that Ryan is going to talk about here in just a moment. Um, why would a composer like Antonio Juanas elect to write in an older style, given that he also wrote in other styles? And how can we talk about that choice and that style without assigning a negative quality to it, as we know has so often and unfortunately in some cases continues to be done? We might say the same of Padilla's polychoral mass style, which shares notable characteristics with the 16th century franco flemish school, as well as what Oregon has called the embryonic stage of Victoria and Palestrina's polychoral writing, and yet is composed well into the 17th century. As these two examples suggest, refining terminology within these twin issues of style and periodization in colonial repertories may be most useful in our discussion of composers active in colonial New, New Spain, rather than European music brought to New Spain. And yet, at the same time, we must square this with the fact that colonial musical centers, especially in the 16th and early 17th centuries, were part of highly interconnected international networks. And music from Europe with fixed texts were remarkably stable across those networks and across really an incredible amount to me, the opportunity and the challenge of doing music, global musicology on sources of polyphony is to highlight the distinct nature of colonial musical collections without losing sight of their integral connection with these larger networks. We must hold both the continuities and discontinuities with peninsular and pan-European musical traditions in play at all times. The study of sources positions us well to do this. In a sense, this roundtable feels to me a bit like advocacy that old method musicology, like source study and stematics and stylistic analysis, may be able to contribute meaningfully toward this emerging idea of a global musicology and ask questions like, what did these musical sources do and mean for their users broadly construed, performers, copyists, correctors, listeners, or others? 
And how are these sources interconnected with local musical centers, not just transatlantic ones? The music, the, for example, the, the movement of musicians between musical centers in colonial New Spain is very well known, and there are, of course, concordant sources among all of these centers, but perhaps we should be talking more and more about <coughs> what medium range musical networks look like, and perhaps even ask how they reproduce or depart from patterns of musical exchange within Europe. And finally, it bears repeating that the study of European repertories, which exist in their own provincialized local networks, benefit is immense, immensely from the surviving colonial sources of that repertoire, some of which we will see later today. So I just want to highlight one example of so many that we could choose um, today to, to maybe think through some of these things. Um, has anybody seen, probably many of you have seen this manuscript report. This is Puebla 5, which is um, a, co a complete manuscript copy, copied by one scribe of the first book of Morales Masses, which was first printed by Dorico in Rome in 1544 and then reprinted in 1546 by Modern and Leon. And um, interestingly, this is a definitely a copy from Modern, not from Dorico, which is a, maybe something that we can talk, print people, we can talk about later. But, um, but what's particularly striking about this copy, um, first of all, again, it is, it is the complete copy in manuscript form, which is not at all unusual. Um, but here we see the, um, oh, and I should also add uh, that the scribe of this, the, this one scribe throughout, and the scribe of this copy is, is a, a scribe who also copies works of Padilla. So the manuscript is not datable um, in a, in specifically, um, or at least I haven't been able to find anything to date it specifically yet, and if others know of, uh, of something, please speak up. But it certainly is copied well it, into the 17th century, into the early part of the 17th century. And so here we see Morales' famous Beata Virgine Mass with its Marian tropes, which had been suppressed by the Council of Trent, mm -hmm. copied. And one could maybe assume that the scribe is just copying what he sees from, from his source and uh, not, uh, not taking on the, the role of redacting the, pro the problematic text. But in the light of what Grayson has just offered um, us in terms of the special cultivation of Marian devotions in Puebla that in some cases actually <coughs> ran counter to the decrees of Trent, I wonder if we can consider this in a slightly different light. So I'll leave that there. Fantastic. Rachel has just proven why I should never speak off the cuff. I was to tell you that we're going to discuss style and periodization and all these things that she mentioned. Uh, this is another fascinating example, perhaps, in the time of uh, Juan Palafox and Mendoza, of his cultivation of a, a kind of hyper-Spanish identity, which was part of his campaign as Archbishop. And now on to Javier. No, I think I'm next. Oh, you're next. <laughs> yeah. I'm now on to Ryan. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, my name is Ryan Endress. I teach at Colgate University, where I'm the director of choral activities. Um, I am not a traditional musicologist in that I didn't spend you know, decades writing a dissertation. I did mine in about three years because they get to be a little bit shorter when you have a doctor of music as opposed to a PhD. Um, I studied at Indiana University and my dissertation was actually about Dominic Argento and his piece Walden Pond and the analysis of the text, the poetic text of Thoreau and the musical <coughs> setting. Um, and you're probably saying, why on earth is this man here? Um, I've always been interested in Latin American culture, and as a speaker of Spanish, I've always kind of kept that as part of my identity um, as a scholar. And so when I learned that these microfilms from the Puebla Cathedral and uh, Mexico City Cathedral were on loan to BU, I went, wow, this, this has got to be something interesting. So um, I eventually connected with Benjamin Juarez and Rachel, and I arranged for a visit. I've been back numerous times since then. And I was trying to find just something original, something people hadn't really done. Um, and I was looking through Tom Stanford's catalog of, of the uh, Mexico City and Puebla cathedrals, their archives. And, and you know, after like the second or third trip, I noticed that at the very, very beginning, there's this guy, Antonio Juanas, who takes up some 30 some pages of this catalog of the microfilms. And I thought, I suppose I overlooked him simply because he had written so much music. I figured, well, this guy's probably been, you know, written about, you know, a thousand times over. 
Uh, turns out that's not the case. You know, I get it, I get into, get onto WorldCat and find out that uh, you know I get like three results. There are no recordings. There are no published scores. Nothing. Um, so that's kind of where I started with this. Maybe about what we say three years ago, 2016. I don't remember. So I think, yeah, yeah. I yeah. think about three years ago. So m my next step. And in the process, which is different than what a musicologist might do, was I was looking for performance. I wanted to record this music first, um, which I did in the summer of 2017, released in 2018, and then I also wanted to get this music out for people to perform. So that I have a set of eight responsories that I edited um, for the Feast of the Most Holy Trinity, and it was just released, I think, in February by Carlos uh, Verlag. Germany. Um, not a sales pitch. I make very, very, I, the royalties are like this, so uh, not, not, not a sales pitch. Um, but one of the things that I encountered that Rachel has already alluded to are these ideas of, of, of labeling styles and, and periods, right? So there's often this broad term of the Mexican Baroque, which apparently lasted a good 400 years, <laughs> right? right? And just as we know on the continents, you know, uh, Baroque music didn't stop the day uh, Bach died, nor did classical music begin that particular day in 1750. So this, we have to keep this in mind too when we're looking at the music of colonial Mexico. Um, and when we look at the music of Juan Outs in particular, we see that he has Going, so before I go there, I just want to go back to what you said about this idea of older styles being viewed in a negative light. There's even an article by uh, Diane Goldman about how Antonio Juanes would actually take music of other composers um, and insert them into his own pieces. Um, that's a story, that's a topic for another day. Um, but the, what I have discovered in just examining a few of, of his uh, more than 400 works is that he really does synthesize what we call the, the, the stile antico, um, the stile moderno, which we would characterize uh, by the now anachronistic use of basso continuo, and then um, kind of his version of the classical galant style. And his dates roughly were 1760, he was born roughly 1762 or 1763. Javier and I have been talking about when he died. We don't really know. Um, he was officially allowed to retire in 1815. Um, there are two other scholars that place his death around 18, that he was placed him as being alive around <coughs> 1817 or 1819. Uh, Javier recently found um, a payment to him in 1822. I don't know why they pay, they're paying him after retirement. Um, <laughs> And it's possible that some of the anonymous works could actually be his, although he was the last person before uh, Thomas Stanford to, to organize the uh, library, or the, the archives. So I imagine he would definitely put his name on anything that was his. <laughs> um, so th there is a question mark, okay, so what was he doing? Why was he paid? And we should probably have a conversation, that would be good. Um, so I would have actually, as a performer and a, mus uh, a performing musician, I'd like to uh, play you just a little bit of sample of his music, so you can kind of hear this this uh, pastiche of of styles.
it's, it's, it's hard to characterize the sound of that. <coughs> Yet, when we, then we might listen to something like this, but it's very different in character. So, many thanks for the invitation to take part in this round table. On Grayson and Victor's suggestion, I will try to formulate some ideas about global thinking in relation to Atlantic sources of polyphony. The topic is enormous and fairly complex, so I will concentrate on a case study that shed light on some of the central ideas of the conference. Firstly, I should point out that from the perspective of polyphonic cathedral sources, which is the repertory I know more, my perception of the idea of global includes at least four different levels or methodological approaches that, that are complementary. Global in regard to the manner of approaching the source it has itself, which not only implies content, that is repertory, functions, and continuity, but also the external elements, that is the material and chronological dimension of the manuscript, chronology, iconography, copies, physical features, etc. These two areas interact, each helping to better understand the author. Second, global in the sense of going beyond the study of a single source or a specific composer as an isolated way approaching the analysis of complete collections of books regardless of whether they are manuscript or printed and despite their chronology. This also includes later books that often have been have a high rate of anonymous works. These seemingly unattractive sources are extremely useful because lines of development and the continuity of the living repertory can be traced eliminating artificial time barriers. Third, global from the perspective of the institutional context, as the polyphonic source has a polyphonic source, sorry, is the result of concrete musical and ritual practices at a specific time and place. This implies studying cathedral documentation such as acta, acta capitulares or chapter records, inventories, painting records, musicians' correspondence and ceremonials to obtain specific details about coping dates, liturgical particularities, performance, or performance practices. This also implies to study the plain songs books containing the monodic repertory it was based on or which alternated with polyphony. And finally, global in relation to other Mexican, Latin American, Peninsular, and European sources, which enables the particularities of a book 
or set of books to be analyzed within an international polyphonic tradition and patterns of circulation and functional redefinition to be identified like a sort of planet that, that is connected and forms part of a much wider universe. <coughs> to sum up, my idea of the global is related to a kind of holistic approach that enables poly a polyphonic source to be placed in the widest possible context from several points of view. And also, his consideration has a complex cultural artifact that reflects an organization in with different systems, systems of meaning that vary according time, place, and social context, come together and interact. Each book has its own DNA. It is a sort of remnant or trail from the past requiring sophisticated techniques to attempt to understand that complexity as a work of art, but also as a symbolic object at the same time. So I think that our final goal as researchers is to represent them from the technical, aesthetic, economic, political, and cultural point of view. I would like to illustrate these points with a specific example. The National Library of Spain holds a book of Mexican origin, manuscript 2428, containing works by the 17th century Creole composer Francisco López Capillas, who was Maestro de Capilla, chapel master at Mexico City Cathedral. It's a unique source for several reasons. A holistic examination, such as one described above, enables the source to be passed into an Atlantic perspective and its complex connections with, with other contexts to be explored. The planning was quite meticulous. It contains 16 works, eight magnifica, and eight family masses on Robert Capilla's own works and those by other composers. Although the source uh, is with no date, a study of the calligraphy, because we have three copies, that was indicated that it was copied during the, the third quarter of the 17th century, probably under the supervision of Maestro Lopez <coughs> Capillas. As it includes a series of significant variants with respect to the concordancy sources in the Cathedral of Mexico. Moreover, some of the sister sources can, uh, that might have been used as a model for his copying are cited in inventories and chapter records. I think that digital technology can help us a lot to order in a systematic and flexible way the variety of connections between this manuscript and other documentary, bibliographical, and with other sources. Here we have some screenshots from the database, books of Hispanic polyphony, a comprehensive research tool relating manuscript and printed polyphonic books of Hispanic polyphony. <coughs> it not only includes general information and, and inventories about the sources, but also about music musicians, localities, and documents related to music books and bibliography. All of this with external links, as you can see here, is the general inventory of the sources. Here is a table with the concordances, okay, and Everything is with hyperlinks, so you can go to, to all the elements. Here are an example of a work that is sheet in a obra. Here a musician in information, in the case of Francisco Lopez Capillas, precisely, with all the list of sources in which Lopez Capillas is presented. And also here an example of the documentation related with Lopez Capillas. For instance, here we see an inventory at the beginning of the 18th century that includes mentions to polyphonic prayer books with Lopez Capillas. The most striking calligraphic uh, feature of the source is the incorporation of uh, over 200 figurative capitals, many of them animal figures. As a morphic analysis reveals that it includes different typologies that can not be discussed here in detail, but it, it includes some local species. Suffice to say that we have reptiles and amphibians, mm. also fish and cetaceans, many examples 
also of birds, is the more common species, uh, species in, in the choir book. Also different types of mammals. And finally, also some very nice examples of fanta fantastic creatures and human figures. This figurative uniqueness indicates that the manuscript was conceived and produced for a different purpose that to that uh, of other books of Mexico Cathedral, perhaps creating a symbolic program that, that goes beyond the music itself. Given that one of the work is a triumphant battle mass is a de batalla, and that an armed conflict took place between France and Spain, specifically during this period, as well as the fact that Robert Capilla <coughs> has just been named full prebendary, it's possible to think in the possibility that the manuscript was a gift for Reina uh, Mariana de Austria, who was created Queen of Spain in the 1660s, and the future mother of Charles II, for the, su uh, the success of her military campaigns, and perhaps even to fund her appointment on that road. It is worth remembering that the Latin American church was at the mercy of Patronato Regio, Royal Patronage, and that the designation of church offices was made upon royal authorization. This is a political significance to all the activities of the Novo Spanish Church, and on the other hand, and a spiritual importance to all the monarchy's actions. There is still much research to be done about the manuscript iconographical program in which two traditions seem to converge. On the one hand, the imperial tradition of the presentation manuscript from Renaissance European courts, being the Petrus Salamir resources uh, as a paradigmatic example. And on the other hand, the tradition of animal symbolism in Mesoamerican indigenous uh, cultures, visible in codices and wall paintings of which there are also very well-known examples, like the Codice Florentine. So both traditions were refined and expressed by means of the relationship between a Creole composer active at a prestigious institution and his powerful patron and stronger supporter, the Spanish royal. So this is only one example of the many that highlight the need to study sources of polyphony in global Atlantic per perspective, and to do so from a multidimensional epistemological perspective. So, sorry for my pronunciation, <laughs> but no, no, no. I think we can communicate. <laughs> Talking over lunch today, uh, as uh, Javier just pointed out, the, the global nature of research, but thinking about New Spain, what a global place it was in terms of connections and influences, especially in the later 17th and 18th century. So please, questions or uh, provocative statements? Yes, Jesus. Uh, well, thank you all for a very, very nice palette uh, of a uh, plethora of themes. Uh, I guess I have a question uh, that is pertinent to, well, you know, what you all have said, but it struck a chord when you showed that map, uh, Javier, of, you know, that, you know, Mapa Mundi, with the broad points, highlighting connections. And recently, uh, I think Alvaro Correcto is just a paper at AMS coming out, James is plugging, uh, about the need to consider different hegemonies, which might seem problematic to us to hear that word. But given the focus on you know, mythology going away from positivism, from cultural studies, from perspective, you feel like another sort of position from above to other centers that are focused on musicological research that have different inter interests, institutionally speaking. So I'm asking here the question in terms of what you said, Javier, for example, and what you touched upon, uh, Grayson, in terms of you know the need to renew senses of order. 
uh, new epistemologies or considering these epistemologies, uh, do you feel that perhaps focusing, trying to bring to life or to light, historical light, that is, different hegemonies, not necessarily to revive them as lossy to make meaning now in mythology, but try to understand this different charting of history that maybe has been dismissed in mythology as a sort of you know global discipline. Uh, it's quite abstract what I'm asking, but I'm, not, I'm wondering if you know. What was is certainly what Ryan referred to in terms of what could be thought of as archaic style. You know, uh, 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 Diane Goldman, if she's blaming Juanas for stealing, you know, that's sort of like blaming uh, Victoria for repeating himself. I mean, you know, he repeats himself a lot in certain cases. Uh, so, so to me, that idea of a new way of thinking of history, uh, and also what Rachel referred to in terms of periodization and, and, and different uh, uh, labels, um, um, uh, there are so many ways that we can go with that discussion, though, Jesus. I would, uh, as you were asking the question, it occurred to me the hegemony of Mexico City versus the hegemony of Pueblo, which is an interesting yeah. thing, thing to think about in terms of new span. Javier, you want to? I think we have the coexistence of different hegemonies, and they are also in a permanent dialogue, so I have not seen any exclusion between all these, these elements. Also, we have to take in mind that we have different imperial systems on the Atlantic. So we are, they are in parallel roles, but they are sharing the space. So I think that what you think can be seen also at different levels. One could get into the hegemony of the uh, uh, secular clergy versus the uh, religious orders and how that plays out. You know, that that's a very interesting part of the historiography and the music of, of New Spain. Yeah. Uh, other? Brian? Or uh, yes. Yeah, speaking of hegemony, it's, it's been um, noted that Spanish buildings in Mexico from the 16th century were on a much larger scale than in Spain. And, and the, the reason for this is simple, it's because they couldn't build on a smaller scale than the, the civilization that they were mm -hmm. supplanting, that, 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 you know, that they were in the act of, of, of um, supplanting and, and uh, taking over. And you know, one of Javier's articles uh, was on uh, 1589 inventory mm -hmm. of Mexico City Cathedral, where he discovered that the collection of music books there was much larger than in many Spanish cathedrals. And, and I think this is a, a very significant point. Um, economic historians for around about 20 years now have been working in the great divergence paradigm, which is really looking at the question of how was it that Europe managed to um, uh, get an advantage economically over other continents on a macro historical level. And, and um, just to sum up that argument in about 12 words, it's, <laughs> it's the, the idea that um, the systematic exploitation of the resources mm -hmm. of the Americas yeah. allowed Europe to enter the Asian market in ways that it hadn't been able to do before. Um, the only thing that China desired was silver um, from the outside world. Europe had nothing else that was of interest um, to China. Um, hence the galleon trade across the Pacific, uh, where three quarters of the silver mine in Latin America was taken across and, and um, exchanged for and, and this is this is also how, you know, by the 19th century, Thai imperialism and, and European domination of, of um, Africa and, and Asia, it was all ultimately a result of the systematic colonization and exploitation of the Americas. Um, and I think we can begin to apply the Great Divergence paradigm to music history in very interesting ways, but we're only at the beginning so far. I think. Um, I, a look at resources and economics, you know, all of this repertoire we're looking at relies on institutions that supported that framework. And these institutions have to function uh, in order to, to make this music. And how do they function? They function through large scale social systems. I, I think that um, the work that's being done on the slave trade now is, is, is part of the uh, most important kind of contextual cultural history that can be done. For instance, David Hunter's recent work on this, the uh, links between the slave trade and musical patronage in Europe. Um, 
And I'm just throwing this out there as a another complex element into the mix. You did a great point. I, with a, one of the interesting things about Halifax and the, the building of the uh, cathedral in Pueblo is that he really uh, uh, promoted the uh, belief that because Pueblo wasn't built on a pre-Columbian city, that it was the pure Spanish place. So the, the fact you're right, it is larger, but that's interesting the way that that's tied in with some of his mythology for the identity of Pueblo. Pueblo is also interesting in that regard because of the fairly significant duration for, between its beginning and when it was finally consecrated, which of course was due to Paul Fox's own inertia. Um, but it, it was used, but, but incomplete for quite a long time. Louisa Villar's article, David, about the dedication is very fascinating on, on that. Oh, sorry, I didn't catch it. Louisa Villar has okay. a great yeah. article on the dedication and, and the promotion of that. Spanish, I think. Okay. Other statements or questions, please? I'll ask. Oh, please. Um, it's, it's interesting this, to see how this work on these this new group of sources. And um, I don't know, as someone who works in 15th century repertoires, um, we had Joseph Kerman tell us in the 80s that we can't do source studies anymore. <laughs> and then that was kind of, that wasn't a huge problem for scholars of European music because for the previous 30 years, everyone had sorted all those sources out. And then now we have these sources that have been underrepresented in the academy. And so we don't have the watermarks and the scribes and the documents. Um, and so maybe there's, a, there's an interesting opening here that like, how do we repurpose some of these methodologies that, um, the, you know, the positivistic label has kind of ruled them out, and and that's I think we've gotten over that as a discipline. That still you know, people are getting back into source studies in in European in European centers too, but um, this kind of raises the question of the importance of that of that work. Um, and like Javier's presentation, it's great to see all those photos. I mean, materiality, all these things tie into tie into fitting these into networks. Um, and then getting back to Europe, how you know we're looking at the way a lot of this discussion has been looking at Europe to the Americas or Americas, what's going on in the Americas, but how are things going on either musically or non-musically in these institutions affecting the way things are happening in, in Spain and in, in the old world? Um, is musical practice, uh, how do we reconcile the fact that there's these developments of um, within a, music is developing differently out of what we might call the Stile Antico or a different kind of Stile Moderno in the new world. Um, is any of that being reflected in mainstream institutional musical practices in the old world um, anywhere? I, I don't know, I mean, I don't know enough. Uh, I wonder if we can open that up a little bit too as we get to know more about the dates of these sources and where the scribes are coming from. Um, it was really interesting to see that manuscript in Madrid, and I really want to talk to you about that um, because that's the, the connection with the Netherlands is very interesting. But how much more of that is going on, and where are some of these musicians working? In there? You know, anyways, just some thoughts that come out. Uh, that's a question we have no answer. <laughs> in fact, this is a very, very specific example because we have almost no evidence about locally composed repertory in Mexico, for instance, preserved in Spain. Mm -hmm. So it's a very specific case, which is related with royal monarchy, I think. But in, in fact, we have also no evidence about the impact <coughs> of these local capillas works in Madrid, in case they were really performed there, which we don't really know. So there is also a a piece by Jer Nathan Jerusalem in an archive in Cuenca, also in a small city in Spain, and very, very small information about the presence of Latin American colonial composers in Spain. Is there a date on that piece? Yeah. Date? No, it's not date. No, 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 not date. No. So I think that at least in terms of uh, written repertories, it was uh, like an 
and indirectional. So probably in the case of oral traditions, in that case we have more information about genres of ida y vuelta, so a kind of reprocession of some kind of pieces, oral in Spain, then reprocess in the Caribbean or in Mexico, and then come back to Spain. But this is in the case of oral traditions. But in the case of you know written repertories, less information as not, uh, as far as I know. Probably David. Can I point out a paradox? Um, the the theatrical texts of Sofiane and Cruz mm. yeah. do come to Spain. They have, they're printed there. They're reset by professors. So it's really interesting. You get texts going from the colonies to Spain, but, but and and also you know well as 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 we know you get the Sarabat and the Shakar and and yeah. the and, and the, 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 all sorts of things coming from from the New World to Spain. That's a relevant point in relation to Sor Juana. The Villancicos were printed not as a Villancicos as books, mm -hmm. were not printed as a libretto. They were printed in the framework of Sor Juana Opera Omnia works, mm -hmm. which is a completely different way of dissemination of the Villancico text. Mm -hmm. so in, in terms of historiography, you should always remember that there are stile antico pieces from Maine after from from Spain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> From Spain, after uh, 1700, we don't talk about them in mm -hmm. the period. Uh, and there are those accretions, the pieces that go along with Morales that they're still performing in the 20th century in Toledo. And, and the conventos, too. Yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So historiography, you know, we don't talk about those things in Spain, <laughs> and then we blame the uh, right. uh, colonial manuscripts. You know. I'd also be interested to think through, and I'd say this is a total sort of outsider in the but <clears throat> Excuse me. Not only between Europe and um, the sort of larger urban centers in, um, in in Spain, but also between those centers, for example, Mexico and Manila, Manila mm -hmm. but also between places like um, Luanda, Angola, and Rio, mm -hmm. right? Such that we also have a sense of certainly for the in this kind of oral tradition that you're that you're talking about to understand the specific things that were moving back and forth between that part of the sort of triangle between the three continents would be incredibly useful, and it seems like there would be somewhere um, this stuff in, um, in, in, in different kinds of archives. Um, yeah, so just that. Well, Mark, you had an amazing example about the Franciscans, and when you put up that image, I was thinking of the Moros and Cristianos in Oaxaca in the Valley, mm -hmm. that, that they had Franciscan traditions that could be very comparable to things you were discussing. Mm -hmm. The Franciscans, I mean, I, I think they sent a lot of them to the ends of the earth. Yeah. Yeah. Of the earth, and some of them went between different locales that were in the ends of the earth. Yeah. So there's something very yeah. interesting the, about the religious world. Yeah. That would be a fascinating combination of the musical and the musical studies. Yes, other comments? Please. I just wanted to, you were talking about source studies and <coughs> just a little bit on, um, on Juanas, and I'm hoping you can help me out here a little bit. Um, you know, I, I'm 99% I'm sure I've identified exactly what his handwriting is. Um, but what I've noticed as I perused roughly 80 or so of the, of the 400 works is that even the handwriting of the copyists changed. So he, he had multiple copyists. Um, I haven't gone so far as to figure out if there were multiple working at, at the same time or if he had one and they kept dying or, or leaving or whatnot. Um, <laughs> But even um, when, let's say we have a, uh, a full score and a set of parts, um, preceding in the organization of, of the music, preceding the full score, there's usually the accompaniment first. And the accompaniment simply re usually referring to our, our string-based instruments, because an organ part would be separate. Um, and it would have a cover page. And I am not in it. It seems to not be in on, on Juanas's hand. It looks like somebody added it, but I don't know if it's just calligraphy by Juanas. But then he will, you'll see where there's handwritten cursive by Juanas on that. But then you get to the full score, which has largely the same amount of infor the same information about the title of the piece for four and eight voices with, you know, trompas and flutes and and, and whatnot. So. It's, it's still in the process of figuring out who uh, who was involved in 
in this music. I know I don't think Juanas made any of the parts himself, uh, largely because they're full of mistakes, and his his scores are pretty. You know, they are. He it was obvious that he wanted to preserve them for uh, for posterity. Yes, so I guess continuing the talk about historiography and uh, what you mentioned about Stila and Tico pieces continuing even as late as the 20th century. I mean, with things like Hernando Franco's music, Rafael Fernandez, with Guillermo Padilla, would some of their music have been performed again later in the 18th century, in the 19th century, or should we just assume that they were put away and, and never performed again because we have Juanas composing uh, later on? Well, I would certainly assume that Cuerva Franco was performed in the 18th century. And they're on a very, very small manuscripts. There are, that are, that are, that are actually usually descended from existing choir books. It usually goes choir book to choir book, but they are clearly copied from a, a pre-existing source, but it's not, it, it's redundant, but they don't discard the old one. But, and then there's, of course, the, uh, a huge rebinding effort uh, in the second half of the 18th century of, of great swaths of that repertory, which seems to indicate, it seems to indicate that they continue to use. That's a very interesting uh, distinction between Puebla and Mexico City, the maintenance of the acapella repertory much later as the central part of the literature. Yeah. Well, actually, my question follows up on the rebinding. Um, does rebinding mean that repertory is being per still performed, or is it being preserved? Yeah. Uh, right. I, I, in, in a way, uh, again, I, I guess it dep depends what then the state of the binding is, right? Because it's beautifully bound and it's clean, mm. then I would think of it more as a preservation of something that, that is considered to be worth preserving. And so I, th I think the, the question <laughs> of keeping material items because they are valuable as such, because they represent a long duration of a particular spiritual tradition. Yeah. Again, I mean, you, you mentioned that San Diego continues in Spain, it continues in Italy as well. Right? We, we don't like to tell that story because it doesn't tell a story of progress. Mm -hmm. But certainly notions of maintaining repertories because they are valuable in certain um, iconic ways. Mm -hmm. right? I think, in, in a way, we have much to learn about those practices, if they're well made, uh, preserved in Puebla and Mexico City, that is almost more than we would have of some place like Rome, where things get recycled so much and maybe not preserved quite as much in as, you know, circumscribed a way. I think we have a dissenting opinion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically, I mean, if you look at even now how uh, a cathedral works, music in a cathedral works, it has nothing to do with uh, music for, for concerts, it's, not, it's, it's just a, 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 a repertory, it's just a canon of music that is, is used continuously. Mm -hmm. And then in the same celebration, you can be using a plain chant and then a motet from the 17th mm -hmm. century, and then a psalm from, I mean, so it's, it's, it's just a matter of having enough material to be changing it along the year, uh, and then uh, vary, and then of course you have the, the new music, continuous new music from new mm. chapel masters. Mm. So, I mean, and this is common to any any cathedral. Uh, and well, I mean, it's, it's nothing to do with archives and it's nothing to do with concert music. I mean, it's, it's something completely different. It's, it's practical music, it's music for a purpose. So it is, it's, uh, I, I would say exactly the contrary. If the music is not sung anymore, it's People, yeah, they get rid of it. But, but, but clearly not, not in Puebla, right? Because they kept it. So, so I, I, I think yes and, right? I think yeah. it's absolutely true that, that cathedral music is functional, but I think there are instances of cathedral music being kept because of its inherent um, traditional value, but I would defer to folks who work in that repertoire. I, I agree, and in some places in Puebla, those later sources do show, so show a lot of signs. Okay. So, so I, I don't Good. know that there's an example that you can point to in Puebla Very, very few of, by that point. 
I wanted to add with this discussion of music and it's whether it's, it's something that served a practical purpose or not. Um, in these cathedral archives, we also find works by Palestrina, Mozart, Haydn. This music was coming from the continent over here, which would or would, which would suggest that it was it was meant for for performance. There's a practicality to it uh, because, with the exception of uh, Lopez Capillas, these uh, Maestros de Capillas were coming from they were coming from the continents. They and, and Serving in these in these various capacities. Yes. Uh, yes Going back to what Professor uh, Valentino said here, I think the question is really really important because uh, I hear, uh, of course, Javier. I hope people can correct me. Uh, in terms of uses, usage and practice and preservation, for example, memory. <coughs> there are books that were preserved certainly to keep training people on how to and write, which is telling of something. Also, in terms of repertoire, you know, there's a book by Victoria that was copied in the 18th century. Music by Victoria, and furthermore, I don't know if you remember this book, Javier. Uh, it is a book in Mexico City Cathedral, 19th century produced, made, that it weighs a ton. I could not lift it myself because I could used to lift it myself, you know, these fire books. And it has Bob Pablo Don right there in the 19th century. So we're talking about practice, we're talking about repertoire, we're talking about memory in a way which connects to what you said. They you don't know, quite quite do something magnificent because you know. For the pyramids to erase memory, to rebuild memory, going back to the epistemologies, Greek and Germanist. And then finally, practices this music by Mozart, by Haydn. I want to teach something out here because one, maybe we have to be very careful with assuming that some certain music were meant to be performed. Because once I heard a symphony by Mozart at the Cathedral of Mexico, and it was a big mess because it was not meant to be performed there. One could make the argument that you know there are you know the modern instruments and more sonorous, but the acoustics made it impossible to conduct the yeah. thing. It was just impossible. So I don't know if it was music meant to be performed right well, there. Well, I didn't necessarily mean that it meant was going to be performed in the cathedral. Um, it, 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 I'm not. It's not just uh, sacred music that was that was that was brought over. And we know that cathedrals are like magnets; they draw in sources yeah. from a surrounding area. Yeah. <coughs> uh, everyone, I, I know our dinner and libations are waiting. I'd like to in, uh, 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 pronounce a challenge to Boston University now that these films are available. It, it presents this extraordinary situation like the University of Illinois in the 1980s. So that now there could be this explosion of graduate students uh, uh, describing scribes in Puebla and all of these things that could just be a new uh, sort of um, uh, explosion of ideas, and it's such a wonderful thing. So thank you to my fellow panelists and to our host from Boston University. Thank you for all the good comments.